All right, good morning, everybody. Welcome to the Bridge Center. My name is Mike Waugh. I'm the director of this space here. If you've never been before, the Bridge is an acronym. It stands for Building Relationships, Intercultural Dialogue, and Global Engagement. And the Bridge is part of JWU Global, uh, which also oversees our study abroad department, international student services, and the ESL program. Um, we, and here in the Bridge Center, we provide lots of programs for students to engage with the world and to connect with important topics that we all need to be considering. Um, and we're really excited for today's program that Professor DeJesus brought in. Um, I just wanted to welcome you all, but I'm, I'm going to introduce Dr. Fine from the College of Arts and Sciences to help set the stage. Hi, folks. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Michael Fine. I'm Associate Dean in the College of Arts and Sciences. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to welcome you here today and also our guest, uh, Philip Beekman from the Department of State, the Diplomat in Residence uh, for the New England area. Uh, just a couple of preliminaries. First, as we're just coming off of a weekend, you may want to take this moment to silence your phones. If you haven't already. And secondly, I'd like to know a little bit more about the audience in the room. How many folks here are political science majors? Okay, I'm looking and seeing about a third of the room, which means that there must be a group of folks here uh, from other programs. Uh, how many from uh, CJ? Do we have criminal justice students here? Okay, and what about the rest of you? There must be other folks here from different programs. Food and beverage. Food and beverage? Travel and tourism. Travel and tourism? Mm -hmm. Business. Business. Well, it's, um, I'm sh and I'm sure there are many more out there, but I'm so glad to see uh, such a broad array of students here in the audience today. I think uh, uh, Mr. Beekman's presentation will speak to all of you who are interested uh, in careers abroad or careers through uh, the Department of State or just thinking more broadly about our place in the world. Uh, as you know, Johnson Wells University is committed to providing an education that allows you to apply your academic pursuits to areas of professional practice. And we do that in a lot of ways, but most importantly by trying to help you uh, consider the ways uh, you can fit into that, uh, the real world, the, the, the world of professional experience. Uh, so to provide a little background as to who your guest speaker is today, I'm going to invite up Cody French, a student uh, uh, here today, to introduce Philip Beekman. And again, uh, thank you and welcome. Thanks. <coughs> Uh, so, Philip Beekman has been a member of the Foreign Service for 14 years now. He has served in public diplomacy, political, and consular positions across Europe, in Bosnia and Herzegovina, Slovenia twice, and Trinidad and Tobago. In Washington, before that, um, he was a watch officer and later senior watch officer at the State Department's Operations Center and a special assistant for the Undersecretary for Public Diplomacy and Affairs. Before joining the Foreign Service, Mr. Beekman worked as a researcher at the Partnership for Public Service in Washington, D.C., and as a government affairs consultant in Michigan. He graduated from Michigan State University and later the Maxwell School of Citizenship and Public Affairs at Syracuse University. Um, he is married to Cynthia Abed, who is also a Foreign Service officer and is currently stationed at the Visa Center in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. They have two sons. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm Professor DeJesus, uh, as many of you know, and I'll be your moderator. So um, without further ado, we are very delighted to have you here. Thank cool. you. Thank you. All right, let's see. Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for coming out uh, today um, to hear about international opportunities and careers in diplomacy. I appreciate the warm welcome from uh, all the faculty and staff. And uh, uh, here's my plan. Uh, I have a presentation. It will be about 40 minutes. Uh, if you guys have questions uh, well, we're going through that, don't hesitate to yell. Uh, but then we'll have plenty of time at the end for uh, questions and answers as well. Um, I'm super happy to talk about kind of any aspect of the Foreign Service or working for the Department of State from the all the professional stuff like uh, the challenges of living and working overseas and uh, representing US foreign policy to the sort of personal side of stuff. Uh, my wife is also a Foreign Service officer and I'll talk about uh, her a little bit and our two very different paths into the Foreign Service. So that's the plan. Uh, like I said, Raise your hand or yell if you have any questions, otherwise uh, we'll get moving. 
Okay, so how many of you have been inside a U.S. Embassy or Consulate overseas? A few. Why? I want to get my visa to be here. Student visa, okay. How about you? Uh, I was just visiting in London. Visiting in London and Claire? Uh, uh, lost the passport. Lost passport, okay. So usually at least a handful of people have been uh, in a U.S. Embassy. Um, oftentimes uh, it's that. Uh, a lost passport or uh, getting assistance with something if you have a problem when you're overseas. If you're in the U.S. Foreign Service, you'll spend about two-thirds of your career serving overseas in one of our embassies or consulates and about one-third back in Washington, D.C. at the main State Department building. So that is this building, the Harry S. Truman Building in Washington. And then this is an example of one of our uh, embassies overseas. This is a particularly idyllic example, I think. Uh, former Austrian artist's summer residence, summer villa. Uh, that is our embassy in Ljubljana, Slovenia, where I lived and worked uh, up until about six or eight months ago. I was there for three years as the public affairs chief at the US Embassy. Um, <clears throat> slightly more idyllic than working in the uh, Harry S. Truman Building in Washington, I have to say. I think if you talk to most foreign service officers, we really love the being overseas part, uh, but you do have to come home every once in a while, come back to Washington. And Washington is really where the policy is made, and so uh, it's a very sort of interesting, uh, uh, very different experience when you do a tour back home in Washington versus overseas. So I usually start off uh, by talking a little bit about uh, uh, the kind of top moments in my wife's career and my career, because I think they illustrate kind of the breadth of opportunity uh, and the breadth of experiences that you might have uh, with a career in the State Department. So this is my wife, Cynthia, right here. Um, she is in the back of a truck uh, in the port of Beirut in Lebanon. This picture is from the summer of, I always forget, 2005, 2006. Um, there were hostilities between Israel and Lebanon. We had to evacuate American citizens from Lebanon for their safety. Cynthia is a consular officer, so uh, the primary work that she does is uh, visitor visas and immigrant visas for people who want to come to the United States and then helping American citizens. So if you ask me, by far the most important thing that the U.S. State Department does is help American citizens overseas. And this example of Cynthia is a great one. There were 15,000 Americans in Lebanon that summer. We had to get them out of Lebanon, couldn't go through the airport, couldn't go through a land border because we couldn't guarantee their safety either way. So they had to take them out by ship. The State Department does not have ships, right? Um, uh, but the military does. So uh, we contracted, or we got the military's help and then also contracted out for a couple cruise ships. Cynthia flew in on a Chinook helicopter and was the first Foreign Service officer from outside of Lebanon to come in uh, to help do the evacuation. So literally she was at the uh, port checking people's passports to see if they're actually American citizens so they can hop on a ship uh, and, and uh, get out of uh, Lebanon. She is Lebanese descent. Her grandparents uh, were both Lebanese immigrants and uh, she's a heritage Arabic speaker. So she learned Arabic uh, with her grandmother when she was a kid. So for her, this was a really amazing experience because it was like this kind of amazing full circle uh, life from her parents leaving Lebanon as immigrants to her literally flying in on a U.S. military helicopter to help Americans who needed to get to safety. Um, one of those uh, amazing times in your career that you don't expect, but you sort of realize, I think, while she was standing out there you know, with a blowhorn yelling in Arabic, uh, like, yeah, you're in the right place at the right time, right? There's, uh, there's some reason to this career. So this totally different job, uh, this, is, uh, this picture is the State Department's Operations Center. I kind of love this picture because it is so boring. It's like some kind of boring cubicles and old computers and two like chintzy flat screen TVs and a world clock. And that's as exciting as the State Department Operations Center gets, right? If you watch, um, watch TV or movies, you'll see these intelligence centers with tons of technology and kind of amazing yeah, like we don't have the budget for that. Uh, the State Department is pretty basic. This is as exciting as it gets. But this operations center here uh, has been operating, been running uh, 24 hours a day since 1963. 
So I worked there for a year from 2009 to 2010. I was a watch officer and then a senior watch officer. And at all times of the day, day or night, weekends, whenever, Christmas, uh, uh, all holidays, there are at least five people in this operations center. And so in the middle of the night, uh, when you're the senior watch officer here, you are the senior most uh, US official with the State Department. Uh, this is the place where the telephone call, those 2 a.m. telephone calls they talk about in political campaigns, like this is where they start. So a couple weeks ago, there was this terrible plane crash in Ethiopia. And after having served at this operations center, it's like changed the way that I think. Because as soon as I see something like that, the thing that sort of hits me in my head is, there was a telephone call from Otis, probably somebody from the embassy, calling and saying, we've had a really bad plane crash, there are definitely American citizens on board, international, uh, and it was a Boeing, so there's gonna be uh, US government involvement. And the uh, emergency action officer takes the call, takes all the information, thanks so much, hangs up, and then puts in process a series of activities that will coordinate the US government response. So if it is a coup uh, and you know, change of government somewhere, if there's a natural disaster like a hurricane, if there's a plane crash, whatever it is, if it happens overseas, uh, the State Department Operations Center is the lead. And so that plane crash, uh, the emergency action officer, I'm sure in the middle of the night, pulled out the standard operating procedure for plane crashes and started to build a conference call with all the right US government people from National Transportation and Safety Board and the FAA and the embassy, uh, embassy in Addis and the embassy from the country that the plane was going to, which I think was Kenya. Um, and uh, basically starting to figure out what we're gonna do and what role, if any, we have in it. So I was there uh, when uh, Haiti had this devastating earthquake um, and I think 20, 25,000 people died. And the US was very, very involved in the response from basics like um, uh, uh, getting search and rescue teams because uh, search and rescue teams to help Haitians and also help uh, try and rescue any American citizens uh, to uh, much broader things like the airport wasn't functioning because air traffic control was down. And there's pretty much one country in the world that can land a portable air traffic control system uh, and then restart an airport, and that's the US and the US military. So we were coordinating this huge, huge uh, US government response. Fascinating place to work. Also the place that connects all of the communications for the Secretary of State. So uh, you find yourself on the telephone, you're a very, uh, you typically, the people who work there are very well educated, uh, uh, very experienced telephone operators. Uh, and that's because the people you're connecting are, you know, uh, Secretary of State Clinton, uh, please hold for Prime Minister Netanyahu. And then you connect the call, make sure that it's going, that they're starting their conversation. And then sometimes you stay on the line uh, when required to write uh, the memo of conversation, which goes into the kind of classified archives of the State Department. So uh, an amazing way to also get this firsthand experience of what diplomacy really is uh, and is like uh, as a relatively junior officer. So two of, uh, those are sort of two examples of our careers I think were particularly uh, fun and interesting. So who are we at the State Department? We are 70,000 employees in the US and overseas. Uh, about 14,000 of us are foreign service Americans. 8,000 generalists and 6,000 specialists I'll talk about these two different tracks a little bit later, but basically you can join uh, the Foreign Service as a generalist. Those are people uh, like me. There are five different career tracks that you can choose. You go through a, this long testing process, um, or you can join as a specialist. Those are people who actually have specialized skills uh, uh, that, and specialized degrees, so things like um, finance, human resources, our regional medical officers, things like that. And then what makes us unique, I think, and particularly interesting, so over half of State Department employees aren't US citizens. That's kind of weird if you think about it. US uh, government department, where over half of the employees aren't US citizens. Well, the reason why is because we have uh, a, a, our foreign service nationals. So these are the folks who staff our embassies and consulates and other missions overseas. Um, this is an example of our Foreign Service Nationals. This is my public affairs team from Slovenia. I've replaced the stock HR photos with like goofy pictures of me throughout, at least keep it interesting. Um, so the Foreign Service Nationals, I think, are one of the best parts of working at the State Department. 
they are uh, the institutional knowledge. So diplomats, we rotate in and out of embassies every one, two, or three years. So you're never in any one place very, very long. Our Foreign Service Nationals, they stay. They're the institutional knowledge of the embassy. They know everybody in country, all the important decision makers. So it's really critical to work together with them. They also tend to be uh, uh, really, really great. Um, fun, good people who know their country really well are typically way overqualified for their positions. So um, I think that they are one of the single best parts of working in the Foreign Service uh, because you get to work with really wonderful people. Okay, where are we? 275 embassies, consulates, and missions in 190 countries around the world. You saw the picture earlier of our headquarters in Washington. Now we do have some domestic offices, mostly passport agencies. Uh, here in New England, we also have the National Visa Center up in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. That's where my wife Cynthia works now and why we are here in New England. Um, the National Visa Center handles all of the immigrant visas processed for the entire world uh, U.S. immigrant visas, they all start out at the National Visa Center in Portsmouth in a nondescript office building. Pretty amazing. It's like a little bit Raiders of the Lost Ark. Uh, files and files and files and files. What we do, this, this is Secretary of State Pompeo, current Secretary of State. This is me from my second tour, uh, which was Trinidad and Tobago in the Caribbean. I was a consular officer, so doing visitor visas, immigrant visas, and helping American citizens. But I got a two-week reprieve from visa duty to go uh, serve as an advisor for a U.S. military operation. So the U.S. military uh, had a hospital ship that they were taking all around the Caribbean doing a humanitarian mission uh, and visiting six different countries. They had somebody from each of uh, the U.S. embassies in those six countries fly out and stay on the ship to advise the team and to make sure once they actually landed in country that they didn't make any big cultural mistakes, that they knew where they were going and knew, uh, knew about the place where they were headed. So I was this kind of political advisor. Really fun job, I learned a lot. Uh, also learned I was glad I didn't join the Navy after two weeks on the ship. Um, but uh, a good example I think of, uh, uh, you think you're gonna go do sort of a, a consular tour and just do visa interviews and there are a lot of interesting opportunities you end up doing uh, along the way. So what do we do? Protect and advocate for US interests, protect American citizens, my opinion, single most important thing, implement president's foreign policy, advise the president, coordinate, US, uh, coordinate foreign policy across all US government agencies. Embassies, how are they organized? Well, uh, here in the States, we've got the president and the secretary of state, and then from this part down, this is all in country overseas. So every uh, embassy, every US embassy has an ambassador, is the chief of mission. The deputy chief of mission, they kind of actually run the place, do all the management of the embassy. And then it's divided into a bunch of different offices. So from here over, these are all State Department functions. And then uh, there are also representatives from other agencies. So let me go through. Uh, quickly the different offices. I think it's instructive to give you guys a sense of all the different kinds of opportunities there are over, overseas in our embassies and uh, how you can, you might not be an international affairs major, you might be something totally different, criminal justice or a uh, business major, and there's probably an opportunity somewhere here for you. So the management track, these are the folks who actually run uh, the embassy. They do human resources, the finances, logistics, run the computer systems, also uh, take care of the uh, medical side of things for each embassy. People who are business majors or finance majors uh, might look into that. Consular, this is uh, my wife Cynthia's consular, like I said, American Citizen Services. That is literally from birth to death. It's kind of interesting overseas. If you are an American living overseas and you have a child, you come into the embassy with a local birth certificate to get a US government issued consular report of birth abroad, so that you have a US government issued birth, uh, equivalent of a birth certificate. Uh, if you retire overseas and you get US federal benefits, you go to the embassy to be able to sign up and collect your benefits. Uh, if you're arrested overseas, someone from the embassy will come out and see you. We won't get you out of jail, um, probably, but we can at least make sure that you're being treated okay. You have access to a lawyer who speaks English. Uh, 
and, and we'll make sure that things are proceeding you know, in as orderly a fashion as possible. Uh, if you are, all the time we have elderly folks who are traveling overseas and maybe uh, someone passes away, you call the U.S. Embassy. We'll figure out how to help the family deal with that, get the body home. So it's a really interesting, important, engaging work. I always say, uh, for my wife, it's like an average day, but for the American citizen she's helping, it's oftentimes like one of the best days if they're bringing in their new kid for a birth certificate, or one of the worst days if uh, they have a family member who dies overseas. So you're helping people at a really important point. Public diplomacy. So this is my career track. Uh, it's kind of the external facing portion of the embassy. You work with press, so maybe you're doing interviews or prepping the ambassador to do interviews. Um, you are working on exchange programs, academic exchange programs. We, uh, the U.S. government supports exchanges from high school all the way up to mid-career professionals. So you're actually figuring out who's going to go to the States, what topics uh, maybe they're studying or interested in, where they're going to go, running those exchanges, cultural projects, civil society projects, outreach, anything that kind of has an external uh, facing part for the embassy, you're in charge of. I think, I mean, I'm public diplomacy, so I think this is kind of the best track. Uh, it is the one that's sort of most flexible and entrepreneurial, I think, and so it can be really fun. Ultimately, uh, you're working with your colleagues to figure out what are our strategic priorities in country, and then I, you have a wide set of tools. You get to sort of figure out, like, okay, we need to accomplish this in policy. Which tools can we pick from to best push the ball forward on uh, on that policy. So I think it's kind of uh, particularly fun because of that. Economic and political sections of an embassy, these are kind of the traditional policy uh, functions. So if you're a political officer, you're going to be spending a lot of time at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs or the Prime Minister or President's Office of the host country. You're going to be explaining our foreign policy and advocating for it and trying to get that country to take positions that are aligned with our foreign policy. Um, you're going to be dealing with uh, political issues, human rights, arms control, environment, narcotics, energy. If you're an economics officer, trade, business, things like that. Um, these positions, you do a lot of meeting people, so a lot of coffees and meetings, trying to know who the influencers are, who's in a position of power, how the kind of levers of power and decision making work in the country that you're in. Uh, and then you're doing lots and lots of writing. So lots of cables back to Washington about uh, what's going on in the country that you're posted in and how things work. You're also writing congressionally mandated reports like the Human Rights Report, Religious Freedom Report, uh, State of Corruption, and, and on and on. So you do lots of meetings, lots of writing in these two kind of policy tracks. Regional Security Officer, this might be of particular interest to folks who are criminal justice majors. Uh, these folks have, I think, really interesting portfolios because uh, uh, you're coordinating with local um, police and sometimes military, mostly uh, police or departments of interior. Uh, you're focused on security issues, both the physical security of the embassy and the U.S. diplomats, but then also uh, bilateral security issues, so maybe counterterrorism issues, um, uh, anything that has to do with uh, sort of has to do with security. You also have an element where you're working with the private sector, because we care about American businesses that are operating overseas as well. So you're working with security officers at, uh, at big uh, U.S. businesses who happen to be operating in the country that you're in. So those are all State Department functions at our embassies overseas. Then depending on the size of the embassy, there might be other agencies. Uh, agency for International Development, USAID, Commerce, Agriculture, Almost every embassy has a defense attache, a representative of the Secretary of Defense, that work on military to military programs. And then it just sort of depends on the size of the embassy and what our regional interests are. Like for example, Drug Enforcement Agency, lots of presence in Latin America, because that's a big bilateral uh, uh, strategic area for us in countries in Latin America. So as you can see, we have a really wide variety of positions. Uh, and you can do a really wide variety of things working in an embassy overseas. So who are we looking for? So the US Department of State, we represent America overseas. So we are looking to be representative of America. 
We take this really, really seriously. So we're looking for a hugely diverse group of people because the United States is incredibly diverse. And by that, I mean a wide umbrella of diversity. So of course, racial and ethnic diversity, gender diversity, geographic diversity, socioeconomic diversity. So we're looking for you. There are uh, four ways to work at state. I'll kind of clip through these relatively quickly. Uh, and then we can always come back if you guys have more questions. Uh, the first one, this isn't exactly work at state, but they're student programs. And so I want to take a bit of an opportunity to talk about these. The single best way to get a sense and a feel for the Foreign Service is our uh, student internship program. We offer them in summer, fall, and spring. We offer them in Washington, D.C., and then overseas at our embassies and consulates. Uh, the worst part about it is it's unpaid, which stinks. Um, but uh, everything else about it is pretty cool. Uh, they're 10 to 12 week internships, and in particular the ones overseas, I think are just an incredible opportunity to get a real feel for what a career in the Foreign Service would be like. There are two tips I have for you guys uh, for those. Um, well, first off, uh, the minimum requirements. So you have to be a junior in status. You could do it as soon as uh, after your sophomore year. Uh, you have to be a U.S. citizen. You have to have a 3.0 GPA. Let's see. I think that's it. So the two tips uh, that I'll offer for you guys are, one, our application deadlines are absurdly early because you have to get a security clearance to do these internships. So if you want to get an internship with the State Department for summer 2020, not this summer, but the following summer, the application deadline will be this September, at the end of September. So it's about nine, 10 months in advance of when you do the actual internship. Um, so one, keep in mind that, because you really have to apply super early to go through this whole process of once you're selected, getting clearance. And then two, uh, the tip I give people is, consider taking the road less traveled. So uh, traditionally we have um, applicants, uh, let's say for overseas, you're interested in Europe. We get a slew of applicants for Embassy Rome and Embassy Paris and Embassy London. Uh, if you're interested in or, or uh, U.S. NATO mission in Brussels, but if you're interested in Europe, my personal advice to you would be like check out Embassy Skopje or uh, Yerevan or uh, some place that's a little bit off the radar. Likewise, if you're interested in Asia, um, instead of Beijing, maybe apply for one of the uh, many consulates we have in China. The competition is a lot less fierce for those uh, those positions. So for London, there might be you know 120 applicants. And for Skopje, there might be six or eight. So you can kind of figure out what you want to apply for, but oftentimes uh, if you are a little bit more flexible and take kind of a road less traveled, uh, you're far, far more likely to be selected for that program. Um, we have a, a virtual student foreign service. Again, this is unpaid. This is kind of interesting. Uh, it is a way that you can kind of do a virtual internship, uh, semester or year long. You sign up and you get matched with a project from an embassy uh, or consulate overseas or a department uh, at the State Department, as a department or office uh, in Washington. It could be kind of a cool way to do a project with the State Department, get some good experience, uh, interact with foreign service and civil service folks at State, learn more about the career without having to leave wherever you're at for school. Uh, Pathways program, these are paid internships. I'll say the vast majority, the vast majority of these are in Washington. You do it while you're enrolled. Uh, so occasionally there are a handful of Pathways jobs that pop up in other cities. You'll find those on USA Jobs. And then for fellowships. So I wanna, always wanna raise these. Uh, most of these are geared towards grad students, uh, but it's always good to sort of be thinking early and know that these exist. So Presidential Management Fellowship, you apply for that out of grad school, like when you're finishing up grad school. For my money, the single best way to get a civil service job at State Department, or frankly, any federal department. Uh, if you think you want to live and work in Washington, go work for the US government. Uh, this program is an amazing way to get your foot in the door. It's uh, competitive, but uh, just a, a great way to get in at that entry level. For State, our uh, fellowships are Pickering, Wrangell, and Payne, which is USAID. So we take all together about 70 people in these three programs. Uh, you apply for those at the same time you're applying for grad school. So if any of you guys are seniors, um, 
or uh, juniors, so next I guess it would be juniors because next fall and your seniors, if you think you might want to try to apply to grad school straight out, straight after undergrad, or if you think you might wait a few years and then apply. <laughs> These programs are amazing. Uh, they're highly competitive, but again, we select about 70 people each year. It pays for grad school. It sets you up with internships, one in Washington and one overseas, and then fast tracks you into the Foreign Service. So uh, absolutely great programs uh, to get grad school paid for and get into the Foreign Service. And then if anyone is a computer science or IT major, we have this newer, newer fellowship called FATE, Foreign Affairs IT, uh, also fast track into the Foreign Service as an IT specialist. Foreign language programs. So uh, I always just sort of flash these up and, con and tell people to consider them. As an undergrad, I never thought of doing this. I'm not much of a linguist. Uh, I came into the State Department with no foreign language skills. But these are all programs, Critical Language Scholarship, Gilman, Boren, Fulbright. They're all programs that effectively uh, pay you to live overseas and learn a foreign language. I think that's incredible. Um, if you're international relations majors, you're interested in other cultures, interested in other languages, uh, they're all different. Some are undergrad and grad. Some are just grad. Some are needs-based. Some are not. Um, so take some time to kind of check them out. Uh, some you can have zero knowledge of a language. Some you have to be a little bit more advanced. So there are a huge, uh, huge diversity of programs. But all of these, in effect, give you funding to live and work or live overseas, learn a language. Incredible opportunities. Uh, and I think really incredible opportunities if your goal is to do a career that has an international orientation or has some kind of link to international affairs, even if it's not with the State Department. So uh, that was student programs. Second way to work at State is civil service. All of our civil service positions are on USA Jobs, that big federal government jobs website. Um, Civil service positions at the State Department are few and far between. We're a really small department compared to other uh, cabinet agencies. Like I said at, at the top, I think it's 10 or 11,000 civil service jobs. These tend to be uh, uh, positions requiring more specialized experience and skills. So uh, sort of more at the middle career, or middle of the arc of people's careers. So maybe not the best for entry level, um, but if you want to look and see if there are opportunities, go to USA Jobs. Uh, my best advice for these is to actually sign up for the notifications at USA Jobs uh, and have all of your information ready to go because uh, these, these job announcements get hundreds and hundreds of applications. So I have a lot of people who say, like, I apply, I apply, and I never hear anything back. Yeah, um, because each job that gets posted on USA Jobs just gets a tremendous amount of interest. Um, and so you, uh, you'll even notice on some of them, they'll only take or review the first 150 or 250 applications. So my best tip for these is get notifications and be ready to apply as soon as the jobs are posted, especially those pathways paid internships. Uh, they, always, they seemingly always reach the limit of how many they look at the first day. So foreign service, this is kind of my bread and butter because I'm a foreign service officer. We have generalists and specialists. What do we do? We uh, promote U.S. interests, protect U.S. citizens overseas, spend the majority of our career overseas, and uh, when you sign up, you have to sign a memo that say you, you are available to serve worldwide. I thought that was pretty intimidating uh, when I had to sign it. Um, your first two tours will be directed. So when you join a uh, foreign service class, if there are 50 people in the class, the first week they will hand out a list of 50 posts all around the world. You have to rank order them, one through 50, your preference list. Uh, it seems a bit excessive to me, but that's what they do these days. Um, and then the State Department looks at needs and your skills and uh, kind of sorts them all out and then directs you to an assignment. So my first assignment was Slovenia and my second assignment was Trinidad and Tobago. Um, those two tours are the directed ones. Usually, you end up at a place that is you know, higher up on your list of preferences. If you have some specialized skill, you might end up in a place uh, where you use that. For example, my wife came in speaking Arabic. Not surprisingly, her first three tours were all in the Middle East. She was happy about that. She joined the Foreign Service to uh, live and work in the Middle East. <laughs> if you speak Mandarin, highly likely you're going to go out to a position at our embassy or one of our consulates in China. 
but not always. If the list has a bunch of China jobs, but they don't start for a year, we're gonna send people who don't speak Chinese to language school, and then they're gonna to go to those. And maybe there's no job for you, so you're gonna to go to Tijuana. It just depends on which jobs sort of pop up and when. So nothing can be kind of guaranteed. Uh, you have to be really, really adaptable and flexible with assignments. After those first two, you have a lot more control over where you end up going and uh, what you end up doing. So like I identified when I talked about an embassy, foreign service officers choose a career focus when you apply, consular, econ, management, political affairs, or public diplomacy. And uh, for the most part, you end up doing working in that track the vast majority of your career. Now, my first two tours, I was able to do some political work as well and consular affairs. Everybody has to do at least one tour of consular. Um, and then uh, the rest of my jobs have been public diplomacy. So foreign service specialists, this is kind of the other half of the foreign service. These are people who come in with very specific skills. I mentioned this earlier, human resources or logistics, finance, um, office management specialists. Those are our office managers. Uh, the, you know, if it were 30 years ago, we'd say secretaries, um, construction engineers, facility managers, IT, uh, medicine and health. These positions are the toughest for us to fill. So if you have any of these skills or you're pursuing a degree in some of these uh, uh, areas, I'd really strongly encourage you um, to consider a career in the Foreign Service as a specialist. The way you find these jobs, they're posted on USA Jobs. And usually we post quarterly, so once every three or four months, we'll post the human resources officer opening. And then it will, it will be open for two weeks, and then it will close and it will open three months later. Um, but if people ask specific questions about that, you can yell at, yell at the end. Key reasons to join the Foreign Service? Well, I think that it is probably, or at least in my mind, is the single best way to kind of marry an international career uh, that's adventurous and international and interesting with public service. You have to kind of, uh, uh, it is a public service job, um, but then also has this really sort of fascinating different piece where you're overseas. So uh, to me, that's the kind of person we're looking for, someone who wants to live and work overseas, likes that lifestyle, also wants really challenging work. I told you guys, we change every one, two, or three years our posts. It depends on the level of hardship of the post. So if you're in Baghdad or Kabul, it's going to be one year. If you're in a, a maybe developing country or a place that is somewhere in between, like for me that was Sarajevo, that was a two-year tour. Um, or in a place that's really nice and easy like London, that's going to be a three-year tour. Um, but no matter how long it is, you're sort of constantly moving and that can be a, a big challenge. I think people who are adaptable and resilient love uh, constant change, love learning, uh, really like variety, uh, the Foreign Service is a good career for you. It also is this amazing job where you get to sometimes spend entire years getting paid to learn a foreign language. Uh, so I spent a year learning Serbo-Croatian before going to Bosnia and six months learning Slovenian. Um, you know, like a language only two million people speak. Uh, so I felt like that was an incredible, uh, incredible benefit. Really interesting to mix up a career uh, and maybe go from a kind of fast-paced office job to uh, a year learning a language. Very different from part of your brain. Uh, and that's one of the things that I like most about the career. And then I'd say, uh, uh, for me, it's been an opportunity where really kind of uh, uh, like the extraordinary can become the ordinary. So like my uh, older son, Joey, this was his first like restaurant meal, his first meal out. It was in a chivapchichi, that's like these little grilled sausages, a chivapchichi place in Old Town Bascharchia in Sarajevo, Bosnia. Um, and then this picture was uh, taken on the Croatian coast. It's my wife and my second son. You know, when we were sort of like, oh, what are we gonna do this weekend? We don't really have anything planned. Let's drive down to the coast from Slovenia. And you know, you sort of realize like, here we are walking through this medieval town on a random Saturday afternoon. How fun is that? Um, you also get to meet amazing and inspiring people. So this picture is from uh, my last tour we, in Slovenia. We created a, a women's entrepreneurship program that focused on uh, minority women in Slovenia. Really, really fun and interesting. Created the program, got money from Washington to fund it, found a local partner, 
Um, and then saw the pro I got to see the program through the entire year. At the end, uh, gave out these challenge grants to actually launch businesses. So it's pretty neat. Uh, the US government is involved in lots and lots of different things all over the world. Uh, lots of opportunities to pursue your interests. Of course, you guys might say, yeah, but you have to move all the time. It can be incredibly challenging. Uh, conditions can be hard. Like this picture is my two boys dancing in front of the moving truck before like all of their worldly possessions were taken away and put on a boat for six months. You know, I think uh, uh, it's, it's tough and especially tough when you have, uh, when you get a little bit older, you're tired of moving, um, you maybe have a family. But it's not always. Um, it can be really, really fun and adventurous. I tend to try and figure out what, uh, what the country I'm in, what's unique and interesting about that country, what the people are into culturally, and then sort of adopt that for the time that I'm on a tour. So uh, Slovenes, the place I was just at, they're like super outdoorsy people. They are like skiers and hikers, alpinists. So uh, like climbed the tallest mountain in Slovenia and did all this hiking with my kids. Spent a lot of time down on the Adriatic coast. So it's, it's pretty amazing because you'll end up doing things that probably you never thought you would and, do, and being interested in things that you might have never considered. Um, likewise, my second tour in Trinidad and Tobago, Carnival is like the epicenter of cultural life there. Uh, and so two years in a row around Mardi Gras time, uh, played Carnival and did that. Super, super fun. I'm glad I was there when I was younger. <laughs> so how do I become a Foreign Service Officer? Well, uh, usually at this point, this is where we go from like, wow, that sounds really cool and interesting, what a great career, to the sort of reality of the challenge of it all. Um, so this part is a bit of a downer, I have to say. Uh, but this is the process to get into the Foreign Service. So it starts out by the Foreign Service Officer Test. That's offered three times a year. Um, it is a general knowledge test. You take it, it's free to take, you take it at a Pearson View Center, so I'm sure there's multiple locations here in Providence. The next time it is offered is June, so you'll be able to register as early as May. Um, general knowledge test on international relations, civics, and civics and government, history, current affairs, economics, uh, uh, topics like that. We have a great study guide online at our website, careers.state.gov. Um, and that is the beginning, taking this test. Anywhere from 10 to 25,000 people a year take the test. I just read in the press that last year was kind of a low year. Uh, it depends on uh, uh, the economy and politics. Uh, so uh, right now we seem to be on a low trend. My attitude is that's great for you guys if you want to get in, feel less competition. Uh, but it's 10 to 25,000 people will take the test. You pass the test, we send you a list of six essay questions. You write responses to those, send them in, uh, and it goes to this panel, this qualifications evaluation panel. They look at your essays, look at your test scores, look at your resume, and decide whether or not to invite you to the oral assessment. It's a one-day in-person interview in Washington. Uh, you pass through the oral assessment. You've got to get a medical clearance and a security clearance. You pass through that. There's one last panel to make sure that everything is good and good to go. And then you get put on a list, a register of people that we're allowed to hire. And then if we're hiring, we hire from this list. So the good news is we're actually hiring right now. Um, and this year we're hiring at attrition. So this year we'll hire somewhere between four and 500 diplomats. So it is a long, arduous process. Uh, I will fully admit from start to finish, uh, 18 months, two years in some cases, um, for some people even longer. So I tell everyone, uh, if this is something that is of interest to you, it's kind of percolating in the back of your head, sign up for the test. No harm, no foul. If you take the test and don't pass it, you can take it again in a year, take it once per year. Um, there is no better preparation from the test, for the test, than taking the test, in my mind. Uh, I took it when I was an undergrad at Michigan State and passed the written test and then got to this oral assessment, the in-person interview, and totally crashed and burned. Um, I was you know, like 21 um, and I didn't have a lot of professional experience and this portion is a bit more based on your kind of professional experience and um, so uh, I thought oh, this isn't for me and I went and worked for a government affairs firm in Michigan and then decided I'm going to do domestic policy stuff, went and got a graduate degree, 
But I took the test again, um, and the next time did much, much, much better once I had a little professional experience. So my attitude, again, is go ahead and take the test. The, you might sail through it, which would be amazing and awesome, um, or you might help prepare yourself for a f in a few years when you take it again. Like I said, you re register for that at careers.state.gov. It's given three times a year. Um, you do have to choose your track when you register. So your track is going to be one of those five, management, consular, economic, political, or public diplomacy. There's a wealth of information on our careers website about each of those tracks, what the job looks like at the entry level, at the mid-level, at the senior level. There's also a little quiz you can take that will help you um, uh, look at your personality and sort of what might be the good track for you. So I've got one more way to work at State, the Consular Fellows Program. This is uh, very specifically for people who ha already have language skills in Mandarin, Arabic, Portuguese, and Spanish. Mandarin, Arabic, Portuguese, and Spanish. That's who we're recruiting right now. It says Russian, but uh, not Russian for the moment. So if you have uh, language skills, if you speak one of those four languages, uh, this is an amazing program. It is a five-year limited appointment. So you come work for the US government for five years. Uh, you work in one of our embassies or consulates, doing consular work, using that, the language skills that you have. And then at five years, uh, the commitment is done, and uh, you can try to join the Foreign Service, come back to the States and work uh, in something else, go to grad school, whatever. Uh, it's a little bit different because it's not the career track. It's this more short-term limited appointment. We're hiring for this program like crazy, so we'll hire probably five or 600 people. In particular, we're looking for, uh, of those four languages, Portuguese is the one that we have the hardest time recruiting for, which seems shocking to me. Um, but. Uh, I know that there's a wealth of Portuguese speakers here in Rhode Island, so um, consider this program. It's a really great, in my mind, it's, it's a great way if you're more at the beginning of your career arc, if you're just coming out of uh, undergrad or grad school, um, really great way to get professional experience, get U.S. government experience, work at an embassy overseas uh, straight away. The process for that is sort of, it's similar to Foreign Service, but a bit less arduous. You have to register online for a test and then eventually you go through the panel and then also take a language test. So I kind of buzz, buzz through that. I know it's kind of uh, information overload. So there are a lot of different opportunities from the student programs and language stuff to foreign service, a little bit on civil service, and then consular fellows. Um, and I think we talked at least a little bit about uh, kind of the lifestyle and some of the challenges of that. But that's probably enough of me just talking, and I know you guys will have plenty of questions. So uh, maybe we'll transition to the question portion. Yeah. Sure. So um, everyone, we'll just take some questions from the audience. Uh, maybe we can put the light back on yeah. a little bit so we can actually uh, see each other better. Please, thank you. So who would like to start with questions? Yeah, good question. So <clears throat> for registering for the test, literally the requirement is that you're 21 when you take the test and you're an American citizen. So anyone can register and apply. Um, you don't have to have professional experience, don't have to have a degree, you just need to get through the process. That said, a lot of people have professional experience, a lot of people have uh, uh, undergrad or graduate degrees. Um, uh, the Let's see, median age for the most recent Foreign Service class that came in uh, was 33. So it is, uh, the median age tends to be a little bit, uh, people with at least a little bit of experience. We literally take all kinds. There are, every single class has folks who are straight out of undergrad, and every class has some folks who are pretty close to the mandatory retirement age, which is 65. I think you have to be under 58, because you've got to be able to do two tours before you're forced to retire. Um, so classes will have, people will have just a wildly varied set of experiences. Some people might be straight out of undergrad. Some people might have done a uh, full career with the military or with another US government agency or in the private sector. We have a lot of folks, uh, I kind of laugh, I, I know a lot of folks who are recovering lawyers. So they went to law school, did, you know, worked as a lawyer for like six or eight years and then realized like, 
whoa, corporate law is not for me. I, you know, I want more work-life balance. I want more of a sense of a public service career. Um, so it's really a mix. Uh, I joined after doing a grad degree. My wife did too. She was, um, she was actually PhD track to study Middle Eastern history and took a break, did that presidential management fellowship program and then decided, oh, I want to check out the Foreign Service and came in uh, uh, through, through that. Um, we see a lot of people who, ha who do have international experience. One of those language programs, maybe a Fulbright. My wife was a Fulbrighter as well. Um, people who've done Peace Corps. Um, so I would say uh, some folks do have uh, significant international experience. Some folks have private sector work experience. Some folks have worked in uh, like local level NGOs doing advocacy work. Uh, some folks have gone out and worked on political campaigns. You know, I worked on political campaigns for a bit and then did was like lobbyist government affairs back in Michigan, then worked at a nonprofit in DC. Uh, so it, uh, I have friends who joined the economic track who worked in finance, uh, you know, worked on Wall Street. Um, the lawyers and the Wall Streeters take a big pay cut uh, when they join the State Department, you know, say la vie. Um, so it's really, a, it's hard to say, it's a big, big mix. But when I kind of look at like the Venn diagram and see what a lot of people have, there are a lot of folks who are uh, 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 Peace Corps returnees, uh, have done some kind of language program overseas. Um, certainly people who've decided to study uh, international affairs at the graduate level. Um, but again, I also have a friend who's a creative writing major. So it's, it is really, really varied. The single sort of most important thing is that um, uh, you're interested in public service and an international career. And then I'll say one more thing. Uh, on our website, you'll find this kind of thoroughly uh, bureaucratic portion of our website called the 13 dimensions. I, like I almost hate, like it goes against every fiber of my being to be such a bureaucrat. Um, but if you look at this, you click on that uh, website and read through these 13 dimensions, they're, they're what we're looking for. And so uh, I tell students all the time, uh, we're not like a private sector employer who comes and is like doing an interview with you and looking for an intangible. Like, no, no, we're, we're the US government. Like, we tell you exactly what we want. These 13 dimensions are what we're looking for. Our entire testing and assessment process is built around finding those 13 dimensions. No surprises. Um, they're not super specific. So they're not, you know, a grad degree from this school in this topic. Rather, they're things like cultural adaptability, judgment, oral communication, written communication. And as you dig into those, you can see, like, you don't have to have done Peace Corps to have a great example for how you, you possess cultural adaptability. Maybe you come from a, a small town and moved to a big city. You've got a lot to say about cultural adaptability from that experience. So uh, one of the things that I kind of love about the process is you can be like my wife, who was sort of like a dream all-star foreign service candidate, you know, like uh, uh, Arabic speaker, amazing degree from best university in the country, all this international experience. You can be like me. Um, I went to a public university in the Midwest, came in with no language skills, and the whole sum of my uh, international experience was like a six-week summer study abroad but I was able to somehow convince them that I had those dimensions uh, from you know, experiences here in the US. So it's pretty flexible. <coughs> yeah. For people who are pursuing degrees in law, but would be interested in serving as, a foreign, uh, as part of the Foreign Service, what track would you recommend most for the people with that degree? Well, I think we have a lot of, uh, we do have a lot of people who went to law school. Um, and it makes sense to me if you actually look at those dimensions, a lot of them are things that you focus a lot on in law school, like uh, you know, your critical analysis skills and then oral communication, written communication. Those are skills that like law school uh, <coughs> is really focused on, on imprinting in your brain. So I think that's why probably people who are lawyers or trained lawyers do pretty well on the exam. Um, that said, if you're interested in joining the Foreign Service, um, I would never recommend that you go to law school. Like, I'd only recommend for you to spend the money and the time in law school if you want to be a lawyer, you know? Um, uh, because you don't, the Foreign Service process doesn't require a law degree. So uh, uh, I guess when people say, well, what should I do if I, I think I want to go to graduate school or go, you know, go get another degree? Like, pick something that you're really passionate about. 
And that sounds sort of corny, um, but you're going to do really well. You're going to care about it. Your money's going to be well spent because you actually like what you're studying. Um, and at least for us, it doesn't matter what the degree, if there is even a degree. What matters more is the experiential stuff that you can present uh, during the oral assessment where you talk about, hey, I had this experience and here's how it shows that I have great judgment and would make a good foreign service officer. So would you suggest that the path is really either go to law school, get your law degree, and then if you want to apply as a specialist, that that might be a better route? Uh, well, I'm trying to think. We don't have any specialist jobs that are uh, specific for lawyers. So most lawyers who join the State Department come in as Foreign Service generalists, like oftentimes political officers or public diplomacy or econ officers. There is a substantial law office in, in the department in, um, uh, in Washington uh, that handles sort of these fascinating but also like pretty arcane international legal issues. Um, so if you really are passionate about international law and you want to end up at a place like that, you know, you could study international law and probably go work at a uh, law firm that handles a lot of international issues, trade issues, or transportation issues. And then uh, your path might take you to the State Department sort of 10 or 15 years in. Uh, because for civil service jobs, like I said, we're usually hiring people with sort of more mid-career with experience. And so you'd probably get some law experience working in either the private sector or you know, a law firm and then come in. Other questions? I've, uh, I have a question in regards to, to family matters. Um, when you are you know, overseas uh, doing a tour somewhere, you are, of course, as I saw, you're allowed to bring your family. But if you're having dual careers, is it uncommon for uh, someone's wife or a husband to stay in the United States while the other one uh, travels? Yeah, it's a good question. And this is uh, incredibly challenging um, for uh, my wife and for myself, you know, we have this great added benefit that we're both foreign service officers, and this is increasing. I mean, maybe 12% of the foreign service are, we, we say, tandem couples, like a tandem bicycle. Um, <laughs> that's the official term, a tandem couple. Uh, but it, ha it ha brings with it its own host of challenges, like trying to both get jobs at the same post at the same time, um, which uh, is really, really hard. Um, so. What you find is sort of everybody has a, a different, everyone has their own situation. Um, maybe you're a tandem couple, so you're both working at state, or one of you works at USA and the other one works at state. And you're constantly trying to figure out how to square that circle and get jobs together. Um, maybe, I, I think in a like totally ideal world, you have one, uh, one part of a partnership um, who is a diplomat and then the other one has the, an amazingly transportable job like a graphic designer um, or maybe they're you know a writer or you know freelance something uh, because then that person can work from anywhere so I've got a friend who's uh, uh, her husband is an IT guy and he's been teleworking for a, a company out of Philadelphia for like 15 years from all over Europe um, and I've got another friend who's a professional um, photo editor so she teleworks, uh, her husband's the diplomat, she teleworks, and it's awesome because she works in Europe and all her product is done uh, before New York wakes up. So uh, that kind of works perfectly. Now, the reality is that there are a heck of a lot of people whose partner or spouse, uh, their career takes the hit. Um, I think the version of the Foreign Service uh, 30 or 50 years ago was this very traditional, there was a diplomat and there was a trailing spouse who kind of took care of stuff at home. Um, well, we live in a really different world than that now. Uh, and so you kind of do your best. Sometimes, uh, sometimes you're choosing posts based on the partner's ability to get a job. But if your partner ha is a doctor or uh, you know, has a job that's not very transferable or licenses aren't going to be transferred to a different country, it's going to be hard. In some countries, people don't, the go host government won't give permission for spouses to work. So they simply can't work. In some countries, they can work, but the local economy, you know, it's a developing country, and you're basically working for free from a U.S. context. You know, it's effectively volunteer work. Uh, so it's, that is a huge, huge challenge for a lot, of, a lot of people. There are jobs available at the embassy sometimes for spouses, 
uh, a full disclosure, like these tend to be kind of clerical jobs or like security escort jobs. Uh, not like, uh, not often are they like super professional fulfilling jobs. So uh, I think it depends. I mean, I've got a lot of friends who figure out how to make it work. Uh, one of my good buddies, his wife is a university professor. So she's had a lot of luck finding places where she can teach, but then she's always an adjunct, you know, and she's never tenure track. So that's, that, you know, it's not as fulfilling as like getting a tenure track job and pursuing that. <coughs> so it's a big challenge. And as you're choosing career or choosing positions, you have to take into account things like that, like where your spouse might be happy, uh, where they might actually be able to work, whether there are schools there that, uh, that are good for your kids. So it becomes much, much more complicated. Um, you know, when I was like 25 and single, the world's your oyster, right? But when you're 40 and married and have two small kids, you have to make uh, your number of posts that you're excited about dwindles um, based on that. And you all will get to 40. <laughs> Seems it seems a long way away, I'm sure. Yes, but yes. other questions? Oh, Feroz. Hi, I'm Feroz. I'm, I'm not a citizen of US, but I, I would like to know what are one of the challenges that you faced about your career until now, um, and if you can give us an example on how to deal with it. Hmm. So a big challenge. I think the moving is the biggest challenge because. Um, it is really emotionally hard to kind of reset everything. Um, when we moved, when we first moved to Bosnia, we had, so in a period of nine months, my wife and I got married, uh, had our first son, moved to Bosnia from Washington, and both started new jobs. And those, uh, I read somewhere there are like five critical challenges in life that cause severe anxiety. And one of them is death, or like death of a loved one, and thank God we didn't have that, but we had the other four, right? Um, and, uh, and that was in nine months. And so you, um, you get really used to that, but it, it, I actually think it gets harder as time goes on, not easier, even though you're used to it. So I would say uh, that the sort of constant change can be invigorating and really exciting, um, but then it's also uh, tremendously challenging. And if you think about it, sort of, you guys, many of you presumably have like moved uh, to come to come away to university or are in a different country, uh, um, but to sort of set down your roots and have two years to do that, and then it, sometimes at two years or three, it's just when things are gelling, you know, <coughs> like you actually you know the folks at the local corner store by name, and you found that community group in whatever your hobbies are that you know that works or like the gym that you go to like finally everybody's talking to you and it feels like you know the, the bird is on your shoulder and everything's working and it's like yeah it's time to pack up and go um and that's hard and maybe i'd say the corollary to that is um for a lot of folks uh, especially if you come from a, a family that's really close that dealing with family back home and friends back home is a huge challenge because you go off and do this sort of big adventure and you come home and you want to talk about it and uh, no one understands your lifestyle and career very few people understand it aside from people who do it um, and there's like an hour of interest before everybody moves on and you sort of the first couple tours, you think that people are gonna, like, I want to tell you all about Slovenia and how it's exciting. And, you know, your parents will listen to you for more than an hour, but not many more will. Um, and I, I have three older brothers who all have, uh, who are all married and little kids, and they're all still in Michigan, relatively close to where my parents are. And so you get used to sort of being far away, both physically, but then in some ways, you know, emotionally too. Because when you move away, you can't, you simply can't be there for everything. And people, uh, people's lives march forward. And so uh, you've got all this interesting stuff to share, but a lot of times you feel sort of left out of what's going on back home, too. Thank you for this excellent question. Others? Uh, so ahead. I don't come from a political background at all, so this is all kind of new information for me. Um, so my question for you is, do you ever uh, personally struggle with um, like the weight or responsibility that comes with representing a country? Because uh, to me, like, that's pretty far out. That's, you know. Yeah, well, you have to be, you know, it's a, it's a good question. Um, because you realize that when you're overseas, you're on. 
Uh, so even uh, you're always when you're overseas in a another country, you're you're a U.S. diplomat serving there. Um, even when you're not at work, you're representing the United States overseas. You're there in diplomatic status. So uh, you know you get in a car accident, and like you could be on the front page of the newspaper if you're standing in the intersection cursing out some local person. You know. Um, you do something really dumb that maybe could be quickly forgotten in the U.S., it can become a big diplomatic incident. Uh, I think that that is a big adjustment, and, uh, and so you have to be sort of much more careful and much more aware of your actions and impressions, the impression that you're giving. Um, and yeah, likewise, like a lot of times, uh, you're the first American that people will have met, which is kind of trippy and weird. Yeah. Um, I think one of the interesting parts about being a diplomat for the United States in comparison to other countries is that everybody thinks they know the United States. Um, like talking to like Slovenian diplomats, their first half an hour is like, here is a map of where my country is. You know, we speak Slovene and explaining because no one knows, right? Uh, maybe now that the first lady uh, is from Slovenia, Americans know where it is. Um, but everybody thinks they know all about the United States from TV and movies. And so we have sort of a really different role, I think, that's kind of interesting um, in that sometimes you have, like you're presenting the reality, not just the kind of Hollywood, Hollywoodification of what the U.S. is. I have a, a kind of stock speech I give when I go out to universities overseas. And one of the first things I do, uh, I'll use this uh, um, computer tool where I'll have the uh, students pull out their phone. And so what's the first three things you think of when you think of the United States? And then it will pop up on a word cloud, which is always a little dangerous uh, with college students. Um, but you know, it's fascinating, it's always the same. It's like uh, hamburgers, McDonald's, guns, Trump. Um, you know, like maybe not the first things that you would talk about. Uh, maybe some are, I don't know. Um, but yeah, so you're always representing the U.S. and always kind of trying to figure out how to do that best and represent, I think, the diversity of the United States, which is, uh, is our great strength. So it's, uh, it can be a little intimidating and tough. You've got to be really careful. Of course, diplomats make mistakes and do stupid stuff all the time. You just hope, like, you know, you, you hope that you don't make big mistakes. Um, and I think, uh, yeah, it's, it's one of the really unique challenges of the job is sort of always being, always being on. Um, it comes with a lot of privileges too, right? Like when you're the first American uh, people meet or you're, the, you're a foreigner, like I found in some of my posts, people treat foreigners much more nicely than they treat their compatriots. Um, and so all the time people will be doing nice things for you because you're from far away and they're hospitable. And I think it's a little bit the same in the United States, you know? Um, and so uh, it can come with these added benefits too. You know, you like go to a brewery and they find out your uh, brewery in Slovenia and they find out like you're from as far away as uh, the US like let come on let me give you a tour and here's what we do and you end up there for like two hours and you know drinking a bunch of beer with the guy who's at, like actually making the the beer and learning you know meeting his old father who started the business so you all these sort of cool unique experiences that happen based on that too so it's kind of double-sided yeah cool. Thank you. yep sure Yeah, absolutely. Well, and it, it's, <clears throat> I mean, parenthood is kind of bizarre and interesting uh, without the added uh, challenge of doing it overseas and moving constantly. But um, it's been really sort of fun and interesting, especially my oldest son is, is seven. And so getting to that point, this move we just made to come back to the States was the first time he really sort of had friends in a school that he, uh, he could articulate the challenge of moving. Um, and so that, this was probably our toughest move, but I'm sure won't be uh, moving forward. And part of that is sort of this culture, like what do you feel part of? Um, 
And so they have a special term, uh, third country kids, for people who are like uh, kids who grow up in, in uh, diplomatic corps or as expats, because you're not from the culture of the country you're living in, but you also feel removed from the country that you're actually from. And you know this sort of shined its uh, uh, shined in our faces. We moved uh, here to New England, live up in Portsmouth. You know, my kid goes to his first week of second grade, and they're talking about. Uh, the Celtics and the Patriots, and he comes home and he's like, so what, like, who are the Patriots? You know? And that's when I'm like, oh, I'm a total failure as a father, right? I haven't prepared you at all. You know, and he says, if we're supposed to wear Patriots gear to school on Friday, it's like, okay, we gotta go to Walmart and buy a t-shirt, you know, um, or Red Sox or whatever. Uh, so yeah, they grow up in this kind of mix that uh, uh, you have to really work hard to instill kind of an Americanness to them when you're outside of the US. Um, so in Slovenia, we used to drive to an air base that was in Northern Italy. Uh, and probably once every three months we'd go there and it effectively had like a, the equivalent of like a rural Walmart on base. You know, and my kids call that the America store. <laughs> and would, you know, so which is ironic, like we, the thing they know about Italy is that it has a really great America store. Um, <laughs> But uh, yeah, we'd go there and sort of have our America Day and go to Burger King or Popeyes or whatever on base. Um, but it's this really sort of interesting mix where their identity is kind of partially uh, American culture, but partially the places that they've, they've lived so far. For us, we thought it was really important for them to have some kind of touchstone back in the US. So my hometown in Michigan is where we go back to every summer. And so we make a real special effort. My parents still live in the house I grew up in. That that's sort of their American touchstone, and that's where they're from in the United States, even if like they've never really lived there more than you know a month at a time. Um, so that they feel like they have some connection, uh, some strong connection to the U.S. But let's see. A couple weeks ago, I was in Manchester, New Hampshire, for a work event, and there was a Bosnia store, and uh, so I ducked into the Bosnia store and bought uh, these little, like the equivalent of Cheetos, but instead of cheese, they're peanut butter tasting, and they were very popular in uh, Sarajevo. So my son Joey like grew up eating them every single day. Um, his nanny used to feed them to him like constantly, much to our chagrin. Uh, and so I brought this bag of Smokies in, and I mean, he went completely nuts, you know, doing cartwheels, because he could remember eating Smokies in Bosnia when he was three or four. So yeah, it's, it's, I mean, it's fun, uh, but it can be challenging. You've got to actively work to kind of instill um, Americana in your kids. And sometimes you fail, you know? I'm really like trying to get them interested in Michigan State basketball with March Madness. Eh, you know, <laughs> hasn't taken just yet. Very fascinating. Other questions? Uh, so Noelle and then Cody. Um, so how long did it give you guys to learn a language? Good question. So on languages, um, so some posts are language, some jobs are language designated and some are not. If you're going to go into a job that is designated for a language, uh, they tell you what level you have to reach at that language. So we have a one through five scale. Um, and so most jobs that are designated are a two or a three. It's so like a two is a kind of casual conversation level and a three would be business professional level. So pretty, th a three is pretty good. Um, you'd actually be able to sit down and have a business meeting in the language. Uh, and it totally depends on the language. So if it's a sort of easier romance language, Spanish or Portuguese or um, Italian, um, 24 weeks. So what's that, six months. If it's a harder language like Serbo-Croatian, I did 10 months of language training. Um, if you learn Arabic or Chinese, uh, it's going to be two years. And so you'll do a year of language training in the United States, and then you'll go out overseas. So uh, for Chinese, usually folks go to Taiwan, to a language institute in Taipei. Um, Arabic, it's kind of moved all over. It used to be in Tunis, now it's in Jordan, I think. Um, so, but you do two years of language training before then going into your job. So it can be quite a while, but it completely depends on the language and then how much aptitude you have in that language. Thank you for that. Um, Cody. Um, like, should something happen in country and diplomats have to be removed from that country, does the State Department offer like backups or are you just like repositioned to other countries? 
Good question. And uh, like, for example, this just happened in Venezuela, right? We uh, had to close our embassy. They made the decision a, f a few months ago. Maybe it was, uh, yeah, a few months ago, they made the decision to bring back most non-essential staff and family members. And then I think two weeks ago, they decided we're going to shut down the embassy for now and bring everybody home. So what happens is you kind of go into this like limbo status uh, because usually we never know how long it's going to be until the embassy reopens. And so you go back to Washington and you usually do t get a temporary job within the state, state Department. They reassign you and you work someplace sort of waiting for the embassy to reopen. Because so as soon as the embassy is going to reopen, the State Department is going to want everybody on a plane headed back out. So uh, usually the theory is um, you go back to Washington, maybe take a little bit of leave, work in the regional desk for the country that you were in, do some kind of relevant work, and kind of hope that relatively quickly you'll be headed back out to your post. Also, for a lot of people, remember, like, all of their worldly possessions are sitting in apartments and houses in, in Caracas. Mm -hmm. They didn't pack up when they left. They took a couple suitcases with them. So you're hoping that you can go back and, like, actually get to your stuff, um, maybe your pet that you had to leave behind because you had to go hop on a plane in six hours uh, so you left the pet with somebody local so you want to go back to your life you're always hoping to it just depends on a case-by-case -case basis what happens yeah it's a good question so the benefits um i'll talk maybe about housing and then more broadly um benefits so uh, you can go online and see the pay scales, uh, and I, I'd say, like, you're never going to get rich, but you'll never be poor, right? It's like a relatively good professional, um, uh, good professional but public service uh, career in terms of pay scale. When you're overseas, the State Department provides your housing and your utilities, uh, which is great, um, and uh, makes, makes it a little bit easier uh, to stomach. When you come back to Washington, because nothing is provided, and Washington is super expensive, um, what you'll find is like the further along in your career, the less you want to come back to Washington, simply because it's so expensive. And when you have kids and need a bigger place, uh, it can be tough. But overseas, your housing is provided, uh, housing and utilities. Um, if you have kids, they get an educational stipend to pay for them to go to whatever the good local international school is. Um, we have a student loan repayment program. It depends sometimes, depending on the budget. Uh, you have to be at a hardship post sometimes to get it. Other times, uh, like I got it in a few different places that weren't necessarily hardship. So, but we do have the student loan repayment program. Um, let's see. Yeah, that's that's about it. Uh, a pension, which is like unique to young people, right? Like that. There's actually like you could get a government pension. It's pretty generous uh, a pension system because you have to. It's not as generous as the military, but a lot more generous than typical federal civil servants. You have to have 20 years in and be 50. So in theory, at 50 years old, as long as you have 20 years in, you could retire with a pension. Which is, sounds pretty good, probably yeah, to people who are, uh, that, yeah? <laughs> so, yeah, so it's, I, I mean, I think it's a good, relatively generous uh, set of benefits. When you're overseas, you can also kind of game it, like if you, have a big expense coming up you could go to a, a post that has extra pay for danger or hardship um, you know, one of the ways they get people to sign up for Baghdad or Kabul or Islamabad uh, is because uh, you get pay bonuses for those places so it can be up to you know, 25 or 35 percent bonus depending on danger and hardship Jacob so when diplomats are handling sort of those like controversial, dangerous situations, um, say the, the moving of the U.S. Embassy uh, in Jerusalem or in, in the West Bank area, what is, the, what is the process that that takes for the diplomats that are in residence at that embassy? Like, what are the challenges that those people have to face? Yeah, boy, that's, <coughs> that in particular was a, a really uh, challenging issue. Um, I think uh, for a whole host of reasons, the sort of politics in the Middle East and uh, conventional wisdom about politics in the Middle East. But uh, uh, I know all over the world, we sort of assessed our security posture before that announcement was made. Because there was, uh, when there are big announcements made that could be controversial, um, 
we're always sort of concerned and looking at uh, what are the security implications of this. Do posts and embassies in certain countries or regions need to take extra precautions, things like that. So um, you're, for major decisions like that, uh, at the embassy level, each embassy is getting their, their country team, that's like our leadership team together, to have a discussion about what threats are, or protest threats are uh, in country, and do we need any kind of special posture? The regional security officer uh, leads those discussions, usually along with the deputy chief of mission. And you kind of figure out, okay, based on your local context, um, what, what the threat level is and what you need to do. Um, in terms of like how those decisions are made, I mean, it really depends on administration, right? Like some administrations uh, go through extremely long processes uh, with a great deal of interagency uh, coordination and discussion uh, at the, not just State Department, but then at the National Security Council level, uh, sort of deputies or principals committee meetings. These are NSC uh, meetings where the secretary level or deputy secretaries will come together and talk about implications of, of major policy choices and decisions. Um, that's sort of a traditional way of doing it, and then there are sort of non-traditional ways of making announcements. So it just depends on the current administration and how they want to decide things. Cody. Um, is there any particular reason why um, posts are no longer than three years? Yeah, it's a really good question. And uh, a lot of other diplomatic corps uh, do four-year tours or even five-year tours under the thought that it like takes a while to get to know a country you know you think about like i was saying usually for us the first year you're learning your job and learning the place and then your second year our, our sort of battle rhythm is the first year you're kind of figuring out what's going on and what your job is the second year things are starting to gel um you know who all your contacts are you can make stuff happen easily you know the local issues pretty well and in your life, your personal life, things are starting to chill. And then your third year, you're already thinking about the next tour and where you're moving to. So you're like working on getting that next assignment, wrapping things up. So it's this very quick arc. Um, I would argue uh, that is that sort of hurts us in some ways because when you're at the peak of your knowledge about a country and contacts, you leave. Um, I found that very frustrating. But uh, also, they want uh, American diplomats who aren't wedded to any one country, who haven't, uh, for lack of a better word, phrase, like gone native and become too focused on one country, too focused on those issues. Uh, they want people who are generalists, who are like constantly moving. Um, and so that's why. I don't know. You can make arguments uh, for and against. Uh, of course, like nobody's going to complain about staying in Rome for a fourth year. Um, but you know like if they're four or five year tours those jobs will never come open so it's a way to also get people moving and and i think our theory uh, in some ways also supposes that people with a broad knowledge depth are better at their job no matter what that knowledge is so you know, like for example the political and economic chief in slovenia where i was she had just come from taiwan really different skill set really different regional issues but then she brought to the embassy an interesting perspective on you know, Chinese investment in Europe. And so she kind of handled all of the kind of China-focused issues. Then that was a real value add. There's somebody like me who spent most of my time in the Balkans, um, I mean, I know those issues super, super well and could speak to those, but in terms of like Asia, zero. So I think it helps, helps us be more well-rounded. When you're packing, you wish that it was four years or five. Very, very fascinating. Uh, do, does anyone have any other questions? May I ask what? Oh, please go ahead. Uh, what do you think your, strange question, what do you think your biggest uh, failure has been so far? And what do you want from it as a, as a, as a what diplomat? Huh. Well, every time I leave a place, we're supposed to do these transition memos for our successors. And uh, it's across, uh, totally across the board. Sometimes I've gotten literally nothing besides a messy desk. Um, sometimes I've gotten like a 50 page amazing uh, memo that says like here's all the things that you need to know so um, uh, it completely varies uh, just like everything else at the State Department one thing I try to leave to my successor even if I don't have time to write an awesome memo is um, the people who are missed opportunities so I typically come up with four or five people who I wish that I had started talking to them my first month in country 
because they had you know either some they had some unique ability to convene the right people or a really interesting perspective or they they're like particularly important influencers that the embassy has never engaged well um, they're like ripe there's they're opportunity people for us to be working with uh, and I think sometimes because we're moving so quickly you uh, the kind of most typical mistake is you just go back to the well you know you say like oh these four people that we work with are great we'll always go back to them because we know they can put on a good event they can you know whatever if you're in programs and public diplomacy like let's go to that let's give the interview to that journalist who we know is like safe and will treat the ambassador well and like won't mess with us um, on the other hand like maybe nobody's reading that newspaper and you need to go to the sort of more tabloidy newspaper because everybody in the country actually reads that paper but that's a bigger risk and so we're a pretty risk averse culture I mean diplomats typically care about like commas and periods and meanings of words and you know change is very slow um, and I think that we could take more risks and we could sort of try new things more often so I'd say that's probably uh, it's a culture the State Department has a culture that's very conservative and I don't mean politically I mean that we are not we're diplomats we don't you want to be very careful um, and the world changes really quickly now I think that model worked super well uh, with kind of how things used to be and now uh, if you're not changing quickly you're you know totally behind so I'd say that's probably biggest mistake Thank you for that. Any other questions? I have lots of questions about your experience in the Balkans, but <laughs> I, I don't want to dominate the conversation. Um, so uh, sort of a last call for questions. I know it's getting late. Um, well, at this point, uh, Phil, we are so grateful for you. We have um, Assistant Dean Rory Sinertia here from the College of Arts and Sciences who is going to say a few uh, closing words. So if I may. I don't think I need that. No? I I talk loud okay. enough. Okay, so um, Ambassador Beekman, on behalf of the College of Arts and Sciences, we do have two students here today who would like to personally thank you for the insights you provided for us today, the wealth of information. I know I'm extremely jealous that I did not follow your career path, but all of you have that opportunity. Um, so I'd like to ask those two students to come on up and to, are they here? Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for taking so much time. Yes. Wait, you have to tell them. So, do you know, I don't know. We kind of switched to his giving gifts, but uh, this gift is um, a Rhode Island, uh, a um, memento of Rhode Island. And since your wife is also in the Foreign Service, it's a his and hers set. So I don't know if you oh, want to nice. open it and cool. show yeah. everyone what, what it is. But... Uh, uh. These, These are pretty mugs. nifty. The been there across the globe series. Nice, cool. And of course, that's Rhode Island. So, so. I have some foreign service colleagues who collect these mugs oh, from really? all over the world and, and are like transporting them post to post, like hundreds of that's these awesome. Starbucks <laughs> mugs, which is cool. Thank you. So there's one for you and for your wife. Thanks. And then this is also another uh, memento from Johnson and Wales University, uh, more specifically. was not necessary. Thank you, guys. No, we're, we're grateful and glad to have you here. Oh, cool. Oh, wow, nice. Thank you. I tried to be delicate about asking what size might be the best uh, for you. This is great. Thank is you. it? Yes. Yeah, so if, if we need to change it. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you so much. Wonderful to have you here with us. And uh, guys, thank you for your patience and great questions. Um, so I am a resource to you. Uh, so if you go home and things are percolating, um, you are interested in learning more, you have like a few questions that you didn't want to ask in front of everybody, um, this is my email, dir, diplomat in residence, New England at state.gov. You can contact me on Facebook. Um, get in touch with me. I'm happy to do telephone calls uh, and, and chat about any questions you guys have, even if it's a year from now or whatever. I'm, I'm a resource at your disposal. So thank you very much. Thank you. And we hope to have you back on the call. Thanks. This is so cool. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs>